Live from downtown Detroit, home of WDIV and Click on Detroit, Local 4 News at 6 starts now. On top of a pandemic comes a catastrophe for mid-Michigan. Experts are describing this as a 500-year event. A lake's worth and even more of water sent rushing right into places people live and work, raising questions about inspections and upkeep of the dam that was supposed to prevent this. But right now, all some people can do is shake their heads in disbelief. I do not like 2020 right now. <laughs> no way. As we come to you with Local 4 News at 6, that woman is echoing the feelings of so many people who are just overwhelmed by it all. Yeah, indeed. This is all taking place just west of Michigan's Thumb area in Midland County. The Edenville Dam's failure last night sent water flooding down into Midland and the town of Sanford, which has its own dam that's so far still intact, but letting too much water spill over. Here's a closer look at where it all started. That's the Edenville Dam, which is located at the base of Wixom Lake. It is supposed to regulate the water between in the lake and the Titabawasi River, Wixom Lake, as you're about to see, is essentially gone. We have crews spread out across the affected area. Nick Monticelli is upriver in Midland and neighborhood in a neighborhood with a lot of flooded homes there and people scrambling to evacuate. Sean Lay has a look at one family's desperate escape near a bridge destroyed by water in the small town of Sanford. Let's start things off here at six with Jason Colthorpe anchoring our on scene coverage from downtown Midland. Jason, there is actually some good news in terms of the timing of the timeline for cresting now. Very good news, Devin. In fact, they've just learned the city has that the Titabawasi River has crested at 35 feet. They were expecting 38 feet later tonight, and I'm sure Ben can tell you in a few moments that three feet fewer of water is going to be huge for this area because of the destruction that that would bring with it. And the area I'm downtown, I want to show you what it normally would look like behind me, where the river is. It should be way back there. And here's a map just to kind of give you an idea of what downtown Midland would normally look like and how much land there's supposed to be there, land that's full of parking lots that is now underwater because this is what it looks like. It is, there's no other way to put it, it's a lake that's covering those parking lots, a playground a farmer's market and a courthouse that has been flooded here. And all of this water is coming from Wixom Lake where the Edenville Dam failed. And yes, that does mean, as you mentioned earlier, Devin, Wixom Lake is gone. This is what it looks like from Sky 4. Now it's just unbelievable. And when Sean Lay had talked to homeowners there, just looking out at the new view from their homes, they were as stunned as everyone else to see what that lake looks like just empty. By the way, a couple of other notes. Dow Chemical is in Midland. It has initiated its flood emergency plan. No major problems it has reported yet. Northwood University is here. Aerial photos show that campus underwater in a lot of areas. The football field water creeping right up to the sidelines for that for that field. But the bigger part of all of this are the people whose homes were swept away in seconds yesterday and through the night that as that water just rushed through the dam like it was a scene out of a movie. Nick Monticelli has been on the ground here for going on 14 hours now talking to those people and what they've gone through since all of this happened. Nick. Jason, good evening to you. So you talk to these residents and all of them have this fear of what's next. It's good news about that river at that cresting point now, but I want to show you what neighborhoods are looking like at this hour. And a reminder, at this home, the flood water is up to the front porch. That means the basement is underwater. In Chester, we can show them across this mini pond here. Some homes are submerged completely. All of this was a domino effect, starting with that evacuation order that came at a moment's notice yesterday. The water's just taken over everything. It's just really bad. To see the floodwaters claim homes and belongings is one thing. I didn't even get a chance to cook dinner. We had to pack and leave. To have it happen to you is another. Residents all over mid-Michigan have nothing but uncertainty right now. When will they go home or is there a home left to go to? So we might just have another slumber party here tonight. 101-year-old Dot Costello is afraid to ask. I haven't seen her. I'm, I'm afraid to see it. Holding on to her cell phone conversation with her grandson, Dot was evacuated yesterday. She found shelter in Midland High School. I do not like 2020 right now. <laughs> no way. 
Of those evacuated from these homes, about 250 used the shelters last night. And many of them are senior citizens living in isolation, trying to avoid COVID-19. These people have been isolated for two months. We're not going to screw it up here. So, so we've uh, got beds well isolated. Uh, I've got a crew going around every two hours, volunteers, wiping down all the bed posts with, uh, with bleach and doorknobs and tables. If you look close, you'll probably see some of them. And as they rest inside, the nonstop drive through drop off of donations continues outside. This is just incredible. This is what Midland is all about. If I may, I think this is almost the exact textbook definition of adding insult to injury, dealing with this catastrophe on top of the pandemic. And I will tell you, it has been very emotional for people to watch their homes wash away, their belongings go with it, but also on the other side of those emotions to see the community coming together so quickly. It has been less than 24 hours since this dam broke and all of this has happened. In fact, a lot of those emotions boil, boiling over, at times it plays out like a movie. My colleague, Sean Lee, found one of those families, ran into them. It's so surreal. It's probably the best word, Sean. And we keep hearing from everyone, Nick, in the whole area, how thankful, because we're not talking about injuries. We're not talking about any fatalities from this. One family we found at the base of a bridge that got wiped out says the warning system worked. They got the warning, but even then a wall of water was headed their way and they barely escaped. It is a stunning scene in Hope, Michigan tonight. Wixom Lake is gone. The Edenville Dam failed, sending a tidal wave of water, taking out the M30 bridge, then cutting the Curtis Road bridge in half. Right at that bridge is Bill Cyan's house. And Bill and his family was home when the water came crashing down. We was headed up the driveway when we seen the spray look like Niagara Falls coming over the bridge. Once the dam gave way, there was a 20, 30 foot wall coming at us. And, uh, it was literally over the bridge, you know, before we could get up out of here. So, it, yeah, it was pretty bad. The home directly across from the Titabawasi River from Cyan's home was destroyed. Cyan got about four feet of water in his home. He's in tears tonight cleaning up, thinking of people who lost everything. Total devastation. I was thinking more about people down downstream. Think about this. The bridge, Curtis Road Bridge is up here. Bill's house is down here. He never dreamt a wall of water would come over that bridge, hitting the back of his house. And again, he says he can clean up, he can rebuild, but he's thinking of so many others who can't tonight. Live in Midland, Sean Light, Local 4. I'm Local 4 Defender Karen Drew, uncovering new information tonight on who is responsible for the Edenville Dam failure. The owners of the dam have been cited by federal regulators since 2004 for safety issues. In 2018, feds revoked the hydropower generating license for the dam and then gave the regulatory authority to the Michigan Department of Environmental Great Lakes and Energy. Eagle also knew of the dam's issues for the past year and a half, but as we have discovered, not enough was done. Looking back, it was something everyone worried about, but no one did enough to stop. The aging, crumbling 96-year-old Edenville Dam's owner, Boyce Hydro, was cited for years for its failure to increase the project's spillway capacity. Federal regulators worried about the dam's ability to withstand a major flood. Regarding the dams, the state of Michigan is reviewing every potential uh, legal recourse that we have. Well, the governor may need to look at her own state agency. Look what I found out. The defenders obtained this 2018 inspection document from Eagle, where it states the dam's two concrete spillways showed signs of moderate deterioration, but appeared to be stable and functioning normally. The defenders obtained photos from that inspection where you can see arrows point out where the spillway was breaking apart. The abutment wall was noted as spalling or breaking off in fragments. Here, investigators note erosion behind the dam's wall, as well as the pier noses of the dam. The problems and citations go on and on, but no major action taken. The defenders have learned Boyce Hydro was supposed to hand in a detailed plan to Eagle back in March on how it was going to fix the issues. 
That report was never handed into the state. In the 18-month window we had to address this, we had moved pretty aggressively on it. You know, this was this is a long-standing, decades-old problem with a 96-year-old uh, uh, structure. We did reach out to Voice Hydro today and received a statement in part reading, the managers and owners of the Edenville Dam are deeply distressed by recent events. Their primary concern all along has been the safety and welfare of the many residents of the Gladwin and Midland County communities. Many who live here say they never felt their safety and welfare was a major concern. Karen Drew, Local 4 Defenders. Stand by. Well, you know we're going to hear a lot more about that before it's all said and done. And uh, the people of Midland are no strangers to flooding. It happens in something they also find kind of funny is that it's a, a beautiful sunny day because that always seems to follow the flooding. And luckily now as we bring in Ben to check the forecast, the danger is now at least over in terms of the river cresting, but they could sure go without any more rain, Ben. Yes, and I think for the most part, we are going to get that, Jason. You mentioned the updated river forecast. I want to get to that, and you're right. The river is crested. The other change that we're seeing with this forecast is it sort of pulled out the, 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 uh, the time frame when this is actually going to drop below flood stage. So if you look at that purple dot there, that's when it's finally going to drop back below flood stage. By the way, it is at record levels there at uh, 35 feet, but it's going to be Sunday afternoon before that comes down below flood stage. So still a ways to go there on the Titabawassee. Otherwise, we have lakeshore flood warnings up for Wayne and Macomb County because of the east winds still blowing that water on shore here and flood warnings in effect for the River Raisin and also for the Huron River in Hamburg Township. That's minor flooding, nothing compared to what they're dealing with up there in Midland County. Lots of sunshine for the rest of the evening. Temperatures falling into the 50s. Dry stretch going into the weekend, guys, but it does look like we are going to get rain over the holiday weekend, and we'll pinpoint that coming up in just a few minutes. Don't forget you can follow this situation and, of course, your holiday forecast on the local forecasters app. Interactive radar, severe weather alerts, and a lot more in the palm of your hand. Just go to our app store and search WDIV. Jason? Yeah, and Ben, as you say, a long way to go here. Just day three of a 500-year flood, as they are saying at City Hall right now. And as the sun begins to set here in Midland, it's a different horizon, certainly for these folks. And when darkness sets in, they know it's still going to be a lot to sort out, a lot to, to deal with here. We'll be here with them covering it all and join you again at 11 o'clock for more on this. But for now, we'll send it back to you guys. Kim, Devin in Detroit. It's been quite a look at what's going on there. All right, Jason, uh, we will see you again later on this evening. Great now job. let's get to the other problem that has been so vexing the state, the coronavirus pandemic and its impact. Ford Motor Company shut down its Dearborn truck plant this afternoon after a worker tested positive for the virus there. It's the second plant shutdown in just two days for the same reason at Ford. It also happened at Chicago Assembly on Tuesday. The Dearborn truck plant builds the F-150 they expect to be back up and running again later tonight. We will keep you posted on that. Meantime, the number of confirmed cases of the coronavirus in Michigan has now risen to 53,009. 5,060 Michiganders have lost their lives. Today's update represents an increase of 43 deaths and another 600 cases. Also making headlines, Governor Whitmer's contested executive order concerning nursing homes expires tonight. And as Rod Maloney reports, the governor is signaling that she's considering a major change as the current policy is under a lot of legislative scrutiny. Confusion and chaos. That's what Michigan's medical community told the Senate Oversight Committee here today in Lansing, saying that when the governor put out her executive order about nursing homes, that it caused problems because it required COVID positive patients in the same building with COVID negative patients, wanted separation, better care, more PPE. And a lot of it, they say, didn't happen. A mad scramble inside Michigan's nursing homes and the regional hubs where the COVID positive patients went. First, they had to compete for PPE with the TCF Medical Center that opened but never took one recovering nursing home patient before closing. Then when homes installed walls for some kind of separation, fire marshals came in ordering their removal. Oversight Committee member Senator Lana Tice. To have our fire marshals operating in accordance with the law, but in a scenario that prohibits us from being able to protect our most vulnerable is ab absolutely unconscionable. Melissa Samuel of the Healthcare Association of Michigan said while the order wanted patients to be sent to nursing homes. The minute it was issued, we were out of compliance and I had said, you know, what, what, what are we supposed to be telling our members here? And it was just, you know, 
kind of stand down. Democratic Senator Jeff Irwin said. There have been no forced admissions. There have been no mandates from the state that, they mu that, that nursing homes must take COVID positive patients. Instead, the state gave homes $5,000 per patient. State Senator Pete Lacido is demanding a criminal investigation. If they would have just taken restrictive measures and put the seniors in their own facility, we wouldn't be talking right now. Committee members are telling us they're anxious to see what the governor's new order is going to look like. In the meantime, they want better numbers, better accounting of the number of nursing home patients that have died in the state of Michigan. They're going to have another hearing next week. In Lansing, Rod Maloney, Local 4. All right, Rod, switching gears, join Kimberly and I for our Spirit of Detroit special. That's coming up tonight at 8. See how your neighbors are showing up for each other with incredible acts of kindness and bravery. We'll also have a special tribute to the class of 2020. Again, that's tonight at 8, right here on Local 4. All right, we're going to be right back with a check of our weather. And Bernie's got Jim Harbaugh talking about football in empty stadiums. So stick around.